and we are live cool uh, my screen is visible i guess it is okay so hi everyone i see how many 1 2 3 4 5 6 there are like 19 odd people here no wait 17 people here so like it's a low number so to our advantage we can keep this one interactive so if you have questions i can see the chat during the session so you can either ask there or if you want to um if you want to ask verbally you can ask abirat for the mic and then you can speak so uh usually these sessions are rehearsed what we do is we uh, do the whole session internally we in, in, internally at uh, in acm and then people give reviews and all that and we like we try to structure how we are going to deliver the information that we want to deliver this one is in rehearsed so this one can be long and it's it's hopefully going to be shaped by the questions you ask so if you have any questions like please ask okay so uh, before we begin about me i have been programming for 2 years my fields of interest are networks distributed systems and end user software both back and front end and after this talk if you want to like reach out to me if you want uh, if you want to ask something if you want suggestions for some project or anything at all you can reach out to me on silica my app is dushant and my github is at dushant in case you want to uh, contribute to any networking projects that i've been working on okay so let's start now this session is uh, unlike others this one isn't going to have much slides we will i'll just briefly explain some very basic networking concepts i'll try to keep this talk so that you won't need any prerequisite uh, traditional networking knowledge to understand what i'm talking about so yeah let's go so uh, first of all the, the first question i address when i'm talking about something is why should you care why should you be interested in this so like if you remember uh, back in i think uh, 2015 2016 around that time uh, reliance geo entered the market right or maybe uh, two or three years before that but what they did differently was all of a sudden like before them the network cost was like you had to pay 200 rupees for 2 gb of data for one month and now you can pay like 150 rupees for 2 gb of 4g data every day for a month so like you can see just how fast the network infrastructure has grown in india right we used to have speeds of like 1 mbps that was the speeds i was working with uh, back when i was in 11th i think and now my home network connection is 200 mbps by airtel so how do you think this is happening because like your information travels at the speed of light right you can't accelerate that any more than that and uh, yeah there have been developments in how we transfer information earlier we used things like coaxial cables and uh, electric signals now we are using optic signals uh, we we using optic fiber and we using light directly to transfer information so yeah there has been improvements in that domain but another like a major chunk of the improvement is because we now have much better ways of handling network traffic so uh, I'll tell you something. My interviewer told me during a Cisco interview. So uh, he works with the SD WAN team at Cisco, and uh, they are responsible for Reliance Geo's broadband network, the entire network. And they have been working on making it a programmable network so that they can, like, it has resulted in the speeds that you see today. So. that's one of the areas where programmable networks help a lot they improve the quality of service the other thing is like inside data centers like you know what a data center is right it's like this place with a lot of very powerful computers that companies own and uh, all their computation that needs scale happens at a data center and inside a data center the la latency is very important because you don't want a single request by user might get bounced between some five different machines 
which are separated physically so you don't want each of those transitions to take like even 10 milliseconds because then uh, the latency is going to keep adding up and the service becomes poor for the user so we improve the latencies by decreasing the failure rates inside data centers we'll get to how decreasing failure rates failure rates uh, improves latency but that's what we do to make them scale so without programmable networks or data centers just can't exist it can't exist at that scale with traditional networking and with low latency comes new possibilities of services like cloud gaming so like one of the reasons google stadia was possible only now and not back in 2008 because our network infrastructures were just not that strong and they couldn't handle all that throughput they couldn't deliver all that data at such low latency like games cloud gaming is like a very good example of uh, a use case where latency is critical because when you press a button on your game pad like if you're playing competitively when you, when you press a button on your mouse or your keyboard it should react immediately like even a matter of like 50 milliseconds in counter strike if you delay even by that much amount of time you're going to get killed so like uh applications like these we call them applications of tactile internet uh this basically means as soon as you make a request as soon as you press a button it should immediately react so the latency demands for cloud gaming are like very 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 narrow so for having guarantees like that we need uh programmable networks and then the last reason is networking problems are just by their very nature very very hard and we'll we'll get to why they're hard too so like if you like solving problems which is why like a lot of people that i know in cs they choose fields they, they do because they like solving problems in them so you can try out networking you can see what kind of problems exist and you'll have fun solving them okay so that first why you should care let's very quickly talk about what a network is i see some third year rights in the audience so they would already know because we have a course for sem for anybody who's not a third year right a network is basically a bunch of computers that can exchange messages with each other and these uh, th these information exchange channels they are fundamentally unreliable again we'll get to what this means and one thing that you have to keep in mind is that just because two devices can talk to each other does not mean they need to be directly connected so when i say two devices can talk to each other what i mean is device a can get information from a to device b now this can be done by telling like let's say there's a device c in between now a can give information to c and c can give information to b so in this case a can technically still convey a message to b by giving it to c first so a and b are not directly connected but in in the sense of a network they are connected now don't think about this example for too long there are uh, some inaccuracies to it we'll get to those um also let's visualize this what what i just said can you see the draw dot io screen can someone come from verbally yes okay okay i'm uh, cool so what i just what i said was that you have two devices this is a this is b sorry my keyboard is making noise and this is c now from a network standpoint if a can talk to c and c can talk to b then a can effectively talk to b now why this is relevant is because in networks usually this device c that you see here this isn't like a or b usually a will be a computer that a user owns and b will also be a computer that some other user owns but c is not going to be a computer c is going to be a forwarding device and like c the the capabilities that c has are going to be limited like your computer can run a web browser your computer can run discord you can send messages you can play games on it you can write up documents on it 
So your computer is like properly programmable. You can, it, it's uh, like the software running on it is, like, it can do whatever a Turing machine can do, right? But this device C, this is going to have some very specific functionality related to it. So it's not going to be programmable in the sense a computer is programmable. What all it will know how to do is like, you can tell it that if A sends you a packet, you forward it to B. That's all it can do. And there's a reason for this. The reason is the simpler the functionality is of a device, the easier its circuit is to design. And the simpler a circuit is, the faster it is. That's generally a thing. Like a simple switch will react much faster if you press it than a processor programmed to react to something will, right? So that's the point. That's why the functionality is limited because we want this transfer to happen so fast so that it's like this device was never here in the first place so as if there was just a wire. That's what we want. So yeah, C is a forwarding device. So this is a network. Now let's, uh, there, there's some more jargon that we need to go over. So let's talk about protocols. Now a protocol is, uh, you can think of it as like a, a set of rules that every single person must follow to be able to work with each other. Like if you talk about road traffic on, on roads in India, the protocol says that all cars must drive on the left side of the road. So if you end up driving on the right side, somebody's going to stop you. They're going to say, hey, you're driving on the wrong side, so you shouldn't. And if you keep on doing that, there's eventually going to be some kind of traffic jam if, if the road is like narrow enough or something. So yeah, if people didn't follow that simple rule, there'd be chaos. And for this reason, traffic rule protocols exist. And for a similar reason, network protocols exist. Let's again move on to an example. There are, let's say, two switch manufacturers. One is Cisco. They actually manufacture switches. Cisco manufactures a lot of switches. And the other is Facebook. You might be surprised, but Facebook also make their own hardware for their data centers. So they also manufacture switches. So Cisco manufactures some switches, Facebook manufactures some switches. Now, you know what a data packet is, right? Is there anyone who doesn't know what a data packet is? I'll give you like 10 seconds to, write, to point that out in the chat if you don't know what it is, and I'll explain. Cool. So a packet is going to be like a series of ones and zeros, right? So let's say this is a packet. And let's say that we want to run an application like Discord. Now, how applications like Discord work is like it, the traffic on internet is supposed to be like bursty. Like you send some packets, then you wait a while, then you send some packets. But when you're talking on Discord, you're transmitting some information continuously at a continuous rate, right? That's easy to understand. And what happens is your network infrastructure needs to ensure that this information doesn't get lost in transit. So what happens is some packets are given a higher priority. As in, if two packets are at a switch and only one can be transmitted, the higher priority one will be transmitted. So priority is a thing. So, uh, you can read about VOIP, it's called voice over IP, which uses packet priorities to route uh, traffic like that. So VOIP is, I think, used by Zoom and uh, also, I think, Discord. Now, imagine that you want your network infrastructure to support this. Basically, you want your forwarding devices to know that a packet is lower priority if there is some information inside it and higher priority if there is some other information inside it. And the people at Cisco, what they do, they say that if the first bit on the packet is one, we are going to treat it like it's high priority. 
but then the guys at facebook say that if the first bit is zero then it's going to be high priority otherwise it's going to be low priority now in a network where there are only cisco switches this whole scheme will work because all packets that are supposed to be of priority of higher priority will be treated as such and in a network which has just facebook switches that will also work because even then the protocol is consistent but if a network contains both these switches both cisco and facebook in that case if a packet has uh, the first bit one cisco is going to treat it like it's a high priority packet but facebook is going to treat it like it's low priority so in the end this whole link is going to treat it like it's low priority and if you send this packet in this case cisco is going to treat it as low priority but facebook is going to treat it like high priority so even in this case this whole link is going to treat it at, as low priority now this is not what we wanted right and this is why protocols are important now a protocol is basically a set of rules that a bunch of people inside a room sit down and decide so like hundred different people from different organizations different research labs in the world come together they write an rfc and they say that this is the protocol that all switches must follow so the bunch of guys who decided what voip protocol must be like they just said that the first bit should be one for higher priority now notice how a protocol isn't some piece of tech it's just a rule and the reason why it's important because now there's like a central rule that all devices can follow and now cisco when they make their switches they can't just decide on their own how they're going to decide if a packet is low or high priority they're going to look at the protocol and they're going to implement what the protocol says so the existence of protocols uh ensure that even if networking hardware is manufactured by different vendors they can still work together because they all follow the same rules it's like they all follow the they, they all speak the same language so they can work right so that was protocols and now at this point we going to diverge from the slides and we going to talk about sdn in a more free manner let's say so does anyone have any questions up to this point if you do you can write them out or you can ask abirat to hand you the mic i'll wait a while what part of the network is programmable we're going to get to this do you have any questions about what i explained till now okay let's move on so this was protocols now i'm going to give you two different examples one is very practical one is not so practical of why software defined networks can or how they can improve performance and how they are important so the first example imagine google this is google server <coughs> right now what happens like this is let's say google's data center this big cylinder now data centers usually have an edge switch what an edge switch is is wait how do i okay wait i need an ellipse yeah the job of an edge switch is to act like a gateway to the data center so anybody who wants to send a request to google 
like let's say some user here wants to send a request to google they're going to need to send it to the edge switch and then this switch is going to forward it to some internal switch in the data center right oh by the way uh, if you don't know what a switch is a switch is just uh, it's like a forwarding device it has a very simple job it's going to have ports and these ports then can transmit packets so let's say there are um three different hosts right so what happens is we'll call this port 1 and this can be port 2 and this can be port 3 now what a switch does is it's programmed to say that whenever a packet comes for device number for device id b if a packet comes to the switch and says i want to go to b then just output that packet at port number 2 if a packet comes and says i want to go to device number a device id a just output it to 1 so inside the switch there's going to be like a table which will look like this so a will be 1 b will be 2 and c will be 3 now this switch is just like it it's a packet processor so packet comes asks for a switch looks inside the table it says it sees that the entry against a is 1 and it forwards it to 1 so it's basically switching the packet the network packet from one port to another that's its job that's a switch now back to the example we have this edge switch at google's data center right so this switch is the the device that all traffic must pass through now let's say you as a uh, cisco and you manage the network infrastructure that's outside this data center and it looks something like this so at this side of the network is all american computers and at this side of the network it's all indian computers and then you have a switch here which is just some switch that you placed right and then this switch is connected to this switch this switch is also connected to this switch this switch is the one that all indian traffic must pass through so this switch must connect to google's edge switch because you want people in india to be able to access google and then the american counterpart also does the same right now if somebody from india wants to access google they their network packets their network request is going to hit this switch this switch is going to send it to this switch and this switch is going to send it to google's internal infrastructure where the request will be served and then the traffic will follow the same path backwards and the same the same is true for american people now let's say you are at cisco and you notice that this switch is congested now what congestion means is basically the switch is getting too much traffic it's getting so much traffic that it can't handle it it just it, it just doesn't have the computational power to handle network packets so fast or maybe it doesn't have enough memory to hold those packets while some are being transmitted whatever be the reason this switch simply can't handle that much traffic and you at cisco find out about this now what can you do to improve this situation can somebody answer that you can improve hardware yes that is true you can let's say this switch had 1 gigabyte of ram but its queue got full too fast so you gave it 16 gigabytes of ram so then it processes packets faster but what if an increase in hardware is impossible 
that is the first point and the second point is you can't increase hardware you can't just improve the hardware while the switch is still in operation right when you want to improve when you want to uh, upgrade your computer's ram you have to power it off first you have to plug in a new ram stick you have to restart maybe you also need to configure the bios to work uh, with the new ram stick right the same is true for pretty much any uh, device you can't just simply increase the hardware right so that's not going to work in real time maybe later you realize that yeah this switch fails a lot so this switch needs better hardware and companies do that so yeah you can do that later as a solution but what do you do when like in the moment when the switch is congested because when it's congested nobody from america can access google and that's a huge problem now uh, another solution is to pass it through some other switch this is actually the right answer uh, we'll discuss this then let's discuss some other solutions before that shitej says you can increase switch numbers uh yeah you you can increase switch numbers uh inside data centers that's uh, kind of what people do they, they exponentially keep on increasing the numbers so it, it's like a tree there's there's like one switch here then this switch is going to be connected to two switches then these two switches are going to be connected to four more switches like this and like you can imagine a tree here so uh, i'm not going to make this you can imagine so yeah that does work at scale but again this is a network you can't do stuff like that while traffic is still going you can't just go and plug in another wire in the switch another solution is to compress the incoming data again there are fundamental limits to how much you can compress data and for that matter most http requests that you see are uh, like if a company is smart they already enable compression like compression is built in to the http protocol uh, you can read about gzip so uh, http can use gzip to compress the data that is sending and it's a good algorithm so uh, like these scenarios like this usually arise while compression is in play so that won't work now coming to this solution pass it through some other switch so this is what cisco can do now i can't improve hardware here i can't do it here these two switches are going to stay like they are right what i can do is i know that some of the traffic of this switch is coming through this switch right so what if i could dynamically tell this switch that if some traffic say let's say this switch is called b let's say this is called a and this is called c and this is called g for google now if i can dynamically tell this switch a like while it's in operation that you know send all the traffic that's meant for b to c so earlier traffic was going like this now it's going to c and then c can eventually forward it to google now in this case some traffic that was earlier coming to switch b now is no longer going there and switch b can maybe relieve itself of congestion and this is just one switch let's say if there were like five more switches connected to switch b and we could maybe program all of them we could tell all of them to don't send packets to b anymore it's congested you lose those packets send them to some alternative switch instead so that would work right and scenarios like this do arise there has been research in like this is a mechanism to avoid network congestion so there has been a lot of research in this domain how you can uh use network topology to your advantage to prevent congestion at switches or at least if you can't prevent congestion once you detect congestion you uh, uh you basically reroute traffic just like it's done on roads if there's a traffic jam ahead you start telling some traffic policeman will start telling cars to take a different route so yeah that's what's happening here now so this is realistic if you guys want i'll share a research paper with you which uh, discusses how to do exactly this using p4 now the other example i wanted to share with you is 
would congestion cause increase in latency or would it block access altogether both uh okay i'm going to tell you what congestion is i think that will help you better so what happens is usually let's say this is a switch right a packet is going to enter from here and it's going to exit from here so there's going to be a wire either and there's going to be a wire here right now these wires have limited capacity you can't just send any amount of information through a wire so like these links the in network terminology these wires or anything connecting to uh, network devices they're called links so these links have different link capacities so there's going to be a link like which has 1 mbps so let's say this link right here has a capacity of 1 mbps and this link can be whatever right so data can only exit this at 1 mbps but if data is coming inside the switch at 2 megabytes per second then the switch uh the switch is going to maintain some queue inside right so there's going to be packets inside that are waiting to be transmitted they are inside the switch so as packets keep on coming this queue length will keep on increasing with time right so it's packets are going to leave at the rate of 1 mbps but they are arriving faster than they are leaving so this queue length will keep on increasing now in uh in like in a theoretical scenario this queue length will tend to infinity and the waiting time for the packet that arrives last is going to be infinity because the queue length is infinity all the infinite packets ahead of it need to be cleared and so on but in the real world this queue is of limited size right so when the queue fills up like completely fills up when there is like no more space something like this now there is no more space to fill up inside the queue so now when the next packet arrives the switch says i don't have space for you so the switch simply discards the packet in network speak this is called dropping the packet packet comes which says i don't have any space in the queue you can come again later i can't store you anywhere because i'm literally out of memory so the packet is dropped so while the queue was not full packets were experiencing delays so there was increased latency right but once the queue is full packets are no longer transmitted at all so that's blocked access so that's what congestion means and if you think about it congestion will happen whenever the rate at which packets arrive at a switch is more than the rate at which they can be serviced so we want to avoid situations like this because congestion can be very bad for network traffic it's the worst it crashes switches okay so yeah that was congestion now moving on to the second example of why we want networks to be dynamic is let's say there are two hosts again i'm going to call one a And actually, I'm going to call this Alice, and I'm going to call this Bob. And there are two two switches between Alice and Bob. So this is one. Don't ask me why there are two, because usually, if there's just two people, we you just need one switch. You can even connect them directly. But let's say in this situation, there are two, like this. now i'm going to digress a little here and i'm going to say that networks are fundamentally unreliable what this means is if alice sends a message to bob there is absolutely no way to guarantee to alice that her message was actually delivered i'll say it again if alice sends a message to bob which says let's say hello 
the laws of logic the laws of the universe prohibit anyone from confirming to alice that yes your message was delivered so alice can send all the messages she wants but she can't definitively say that her message was delivered now why this is is because networks are like think of it like this if she sends the message who can tell her that the message was delivered the only person who knows that a message was even sent is bob because he's the one who received it right now bob can, you can say that bob can send a confirmation but what if this confirmation never reaches alice because of some congestion or some other problem so in that case alice can't and if the even if the confirmation never reaches her she can't definitively conclude that bob didn't receive the message like maybe bob sent the con con uh, the confirmation and it got dropped somewhere in between or maybe bob just never received the message so he didn't send a confirmation so it could be either of the two and there is literally no way to tell which one of these it was right so no way to actually confirm that a message was uh, delivered and this one problem networks are fundamentally unreliable has led to virtually all the distributed system research that you see these days it's all revolving around this one problem that you can't trust a network to deliver your information so you build systems around it and now we're going to talk about one such system and it's called you might have heard of it the tcp protocol i think the full form of tcp is a uh, transmission control protocol or transport control protocol something like that i don't remember but the the highlight of tcp is that it ensures that information is delivered now how does it do that so what tcp will do is it's going to send a packet let's say your message has 10 packets so it's going to send the first packet and then it's going to wait for bob to confirm this if bob never confirms this the tcp request will simply time out it will fail like so either there will be confirmation or the request will fail in which case alice can simply try sending the message again so yeah tcp will guarantee like if the request succeeds you have a guarantee that yes bob received the message but if it fails you don't know if he did or if he didn't so you can send multiple requests you can keep retrying so that's the point of tcp now how it happens is if you have 10 packets alice is going to send one packet bob is going to send a response for that then alice only when it gets the response for the first packet it's going to send the next packet and so on now this is obviously this this doesn't scale because like for any information that you want to send to bob bob must reply back with something this puts load on the network you don't want these confirmation messages to take up so much of your bandwidth right <coughs> so what we do is we define windows we say that one window is now the atomic unit of uh, transmission so let's say the window is of four packets so alice is going to send four packets each packet is going to have a window number associated to it so let's say this packet says window number 1 so first packet is going to go then second then third then fourth once the fourth packet comes bob is going to send a confirmation that i received all the packets in window 1 you can now continue with window 2 and like this if the window size is n you reduce this control traffic by a factor of n because now you only send a confirmation message every n packets this is how tcp works now for this reason tcp is a slow protocol it's it's not as fast as protocols like udp because udp doesn't care if your information gets delivered it just sends the information so we want to speed this up right now what we know is these two routers like there's a good chance that this information that i sent is being lost between these two routers 
now if information is lost only then it will be sent again and only once all the information is sent the request is complete so if information has to be sent again 10 more times the request is going to take 10 times longer we want to reduce this so we want to ensure that information gets across in the first attempt or in the second like it, it doesn't take so many attempts that's what we want right so this is this is what i was talking about we want by just by ensuring that information gets across we can improve the speed of our networks we can't improve the transport speed but we can improve the speed with which requests are served now what's going to happen is if this is lost if this packet is lost the whole window is going to be sent again and this takes time but what we could do is we could check for windows at these routers instead instead of transmitting information over the whole channel what we can do is we can ask this router to take confirmations from this router if it received the message and then this router can take confirmations from this so now if a packet is sent if it if the packet doesn't reach here alice doesn't have to send it again this router itself can resend it it can hold it it can hold the all the packets of that window in memory and it can resend so instead of the packet needing to go again from alice to bob now it just needs to cover this distance and like so you just increased the you, you just improved the latency of tcp requests because now you don't the, the retries that you attempt when information transmission fails those retries are now between devices that are closer to each other did you understand this does anyone have questions or doubts about this i'll wait for a while so in tcp more the switch is less the latency oh no 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 tcp doesn't actually work like this this is just a suggestion in tcp when a packet doesn't reach if the confirmation for a window doesn't come alice is going to have to resend it the switches are not going to do anything but if the switches could do something we would have an improvement in latency that's what i'm trying to point out any other questions cool let's move on now this example that i stated like i said that there's going to be a realistic and an unrealistic example this example is not very realistic because switches don't really have enough memory to cache packets like that like even if a packet fails to get delivered from this point to this point this switch is not going to have enough memory to remember which packet failed so it's going to have to ask alice to send it again so we're going to have the same kind of latency but if it was possible we'd have better speeds so treat this example as just like a demonstration of how improving uh how by improving delivery guarantees we can improve network latencies even if information trans travels virtually at the same speed so that's the point here okay now coming to programmable networks like the actual technical terms so from this point on there's going to be some jargon involved let me just clean this out all right so back to this example i said that if there was a way to tell a to send all packets to c instead of b like koi bhi packet if it comes for b then instead of sending it to b you send it to c because b is right now very congested so if we could do that we could react to congestion that was happening at b right how do we do this now switches 
in networks have one primary characteristic or let's say entity and it's called a switch table like i mentioned back with that switch the the three people switch we had a table like this can you uh, see what i'm writing cool This is what the switch table there looked like. Basically, if any packet says that I want to go to B, the switch would transfer that packet to port number two, and port number two is then directly connected to device B. Now, usually, the identifiers are not like this. Identifiers are more like this. These are called IP addresses. IP stands for Internet Protocol. I'm guessing you already know what that is. uh i'm just going to give this something random so this is what a switch table like a very rudimentary switch table looks like right now if i can somehow change this table dynamically like that switch table for a must have been something like this can i change this arrow yeah i can so let's say this was port number 1 and this was port number 2 right so the switch table for this switch probably looked something like i'll, I'll put this here the switch table said that if something comes for b send it to 1 if something comes for c send it to 2 this is what it said now if b is in congestion and me as this code knows this and if i can modify this table to say if something comes for b send it to 2 the problem is solved because now i have effectively told the switch a to reroute all traffic for b towards router c so this is one example of network programmability because if you define program what is programmability it's your ability to change things change how things work with the device it's your ability to change a device's function so this this technique it's called table programming and you basically change the entries inside the switch table to uh direct traffic to different places now i'm going to extend this example a little this is just forwarding something right uh just give me a little while i'm gonna bring this table here i actually should have prepared these diagrams before but then again rehearsal ka bhi time nahi tha iska kaise milta device id and then action earlier what we had was the default thing to do was to map a device id to a particular switch port right and then that would the switch would uh, transfer the packet to that port like so so this is what the table looked like so this is like very rudimentary table programming in actual software defined networks this isn't how we do it what we do is 
we have actions so now this is followed what the hell okay apologies i really should have set this up before so yeah so earlier what was happening was you the the switch said that the device id is b the port number against it is 1 so i have to forward it to 1 now these port numbers we will abandon and instead we have actions so now the switch says the device id is b and the action that i have to perform for any packet that comes for device number b is to forward it to 1 now in case we wanted let's say cisco says that any traffic that comes through this switch should never get to this switch in that case we could just say drop if anything comes for b to this switch don't forward it just drop it and like you can imagine how this uh, allows us to make the switch a lot more programmable because earlier the only action was allowed was the forward action but now you can have drop you can have forward you can have mark like let's say if you wanted if you had some security algorithm that was working at this switch and you wanted to mark all the suspicious packets you could do something like this uh mark and forward to port 1 so this would also work now if you're wondering where these function names are coming from these aren't standard functions you you have to actually write these functions usually so you can call them whatever you want i could call this function uh lucian doesn't matter so like as long as i define the function i can call it whatever i want but you get the idea so these functions have to be defined beforehand like before the switch is actually uh, deployed inside the network and then while the switch is operating we can assign these functions to different device uh, different uh, packet characteristics different device ids so any packet that arrives at b i can control what whatever happens to that packet like so so this is generally the programmability model inside networks we we program switch tables now there is more but uh, what else is there i'm going to show you inside a demo not like this so yeah does anybody have any questions about this does anyone want me to explain this again wonderful so this was as you see a switch table now let's move on to a different problem i said that cisco found out this switch was congested how did cisco find out it's not like i like i sit with a meter on every switch and i measure the amount of electricity that's coming in to to know how much processing is happening or stuff like that so how did cisco do that what do you think <coughs> suggestions potential solutions how how do i actually find out when the switch is in congestion like i can think the reacting to congestion is the next problem i first need to confirmation is bouncing what does that mean i 
I didn't get what you mean by confirmations bouncing. Send test packets. That's actually a very good idea. That was the mode of testing. But like I said, networks are fundamentally unreliable. So if your packet gets lost in transit, you can never know if it's because the switch is failing, if the switch is in congestion, or if your device has something wrong with it, like your computer has something wrong with it, or if it's just some physical fluke, the packet just got lost or some bit flipped or something like that. So networks are unreliable. So yeah, you can send a test packet, but if it doesn't come back, you can't say for sure that it's uh, in congestion. So what you can do is send a million test packets. And a million is a very small number when you talk about networks. So you can send like a million test packets and if like none of them are coming back, something is up. Okay, measure input and output rate. So how? How do you measure that? Let the router trigger error when it is congested. So that's the accepted solution these days. So what happens is we kind of teach the router to monitor itself to look for certain patterns. Like I, I talked about the queue, right? Is the queue still there or did I delete it? Okay, I deleted it. So we talked about the queue, right? So the router can measure how, how much of its queue is left for new packets or it can measure the queue length, right? And then if the queue length is like longer for, for, a, for, for a certain amount of time, the switch can then notify Cisco that I'm congested. So this is possible. The other accepted solution is for the packet to just keep track of these metrics like Q length. And then Cisco can ask the packet every uh, every two, three seconds. And then like if the packet says, yes, I'm congested, then it's congested. But again, networks are fundamentally unreliable. So if you are doing that, if you are polling like that, in that case, you uh, have to ensure that you you, you have to somehow confirm to a very good probability. You'll never have 100% probability, but you have to like ask the switch 10, 10, 11 times that are you congested? And if it says yes, every time the probability that it's not congested and just acting up, it, it's very low. Also with, with the push-based system where the switch was the one that notified Cisco instead of Cisco polling, even there, the, the unreliability comes into play. So it's very possible that because the network has degraded so much, even the switch's message to Cisco doesn't reach it. So then Cisco would never find out it's congested because even that congestion notification got lost in transit. <coughs> so in a case like that, that's even worse. Cisco would never find out. So in the first case, they would at least be reacting to a false positive. In this case, they just won't find out. So that's also not what we want. So usually there's like a hybrid of both approaches. We pull and switch is also push. But can you think of a way of doing this with just tables? Well, it's not possible. So like, if you were thinking, I'm sorry, uh, you can't track metrics with tables. Tables are supposed to tell the switch what to do with, with certain packets, like how to read a packet's data and then decide what to do with it. That's what a table is for. Table isn't, tables are not for taking metrics. So for metrics, you have some additional entities on the switch, like you have counter objects which will count the packets that are coming to a port. Then there is a Q length and so on and so forth. Won't it add to the congestion if we're asking it for congestion multiple times? Yes, it would, but when congestion happens, usually there are like uh, hundreds of millions of packets arriving every, uh, every second, I guess. Like, 
things are happening at the nanosecond level so if you send like 12 extra packets it's uh, not really that big a deal yeah devji says the server may have an expected amount of inflow but the received amount of data packets might be different see the thing with these approaches is that people somehow assume that you can just look at the network from above and know what's happening but to actually measure the inflow and the outflow you need to be at the switch only the switch can do that or you can come up with like some very complicated algorithm where the where the device before that switch and the device after that switch somehow collaborate and uh, to decide whether the switch between them is uh, is congested if you can think of an algorithm like that you're going to win a turing award or something but uh, it's like it's generally that's not uh, how we like that's not a feasible solution like what you're saying is like uh, it's like begging the question like you are assuming that you already have a solution for the problem that i'm asking the solution for so you can't just measure it like that you need some programmable elements to measure it so inside switches you have uh, like counters you have information about the queue so you can access this i'm going to show you all of this in a real p4 program in like 10 minutes there's counters there's queues there is uh, what else is there there are registers where you can store some information for use and so on and you can program these right so this is one thing the other thing is what's a counter uh, we'll get to this when i demo my uh, my example p4 code so i'll tell you about this so what you just saw this whole thing this is called the data plane of the network what does the data plane mean it's that level of the network which is actually handling the routing of data that's actually forwarding the data the data plane is where the data lives so it's the the switch level so devices in the data plane are not very programmable they're usually rudimentary even the whatever programmability they have they have in terms of uh, uh, the this table programmability counters and all that you can't program a switch the same way you program a linux machine is what i'm saying so this is the data plane where the data is now i said that cisco will react when there's a congestion at this switch but what do i mean when i say cisco will react who is cisco here is this some engineer at cisco who is constantly looking at all the switch stacks and then deciding that this switch is in congestion and then manually uh, changing this switch's table entries to route traffic to this switch do you think it's done manually it but obviously it, it it isn't because like there are thousands of switches and a single person can't look at those many data uh, switches they he can't monitor or manage those many switches and you can't hire a thousand people because that's just economically stupid so what we do is instead we have like one big entity this is the control plane oh you can't see my screen wait can you see it now oh it was oops okay is it still visible okay cool i think uh, something's wrong with your internet roof okay so uh, like like i was saying so doing this all all this monitoring manually it's it's not feasible it's not economically feasible it's also not very fast because a person is going to take like a few even in the best cases a few milliseconds to uh, to react to something and, and 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 a few milliseconds is like a lot of time when you talk about networks like i said things are happening at the nanosecond scale packets are arriving every nanosecond inside a data center and if you take a millisecond your switch is already going to go down so you want to react like very fast at the order of microseconds maybe so what you do <coughs> 
you have a control plane and this control plane is now made up of actual computers like machines that are running linux or windows or mac os or something so a control plane is like fully programmable and then you can program this control plane to constantly listen to notifications from this switch and to have control over this switch so now what can happen is wait the arrow should be the other way around so now this switch can internally monitor itself it can uh, track its queue length and when it detects that yes i am in congestion some threshold has passed it can notify the control plane and now the control plane can tell switch a to change its table entries so and this is easy to do at the control plane because the control plane is like fully programmable you can have if else statements for loops and everything that you can run on it's basically one big linux machine if you think about it so this is what the control plane means so the data plane is responsible for actually routing and managing the data and the control plane is for managing the data plane so the control plane is like uh, the brain of the network and the data plane is like the muscles so you need muscles to function but your muscles won't be coordinated if your brain wasn't there so this is the use case and i tell you what we are going to talk about p4 in in like 5 minutes but before p4 we had uh, actually not before p4 it's still around it's still very famous it's adopted by google it started at stanford it's called openflow openflow is like an sdn protocol uh, we talked about what a protocol is now switches that implement openflow expose a certain api they expose certain functionalities like any openflow switch will expose an api that the control plane can contact and manipulate its tables it will expose a separate counters api that the control plane can access and manipulate the counters on a certain switch now obviously for this to work you can't just hook up any controller to any switch that switch must support openflow in the first place but this was the deal with openflow so the switch came very the switch was rigid right the the switch was uh, in a way set in hardware so it it exports certain functionality but you can't you couldn't change the nature of that functionality it's like uh if if you guys have done any kind of programming before openflow is like somebody gives you a program and you can just change its settings to modify what it does like in that programming language switch where you use a gui to change how your program behaves so that is one way to approach things that still makes your switch programmable what p4 does is it gives you a linux terminal and c++ to work with so you are no longer using some other you're no longer configuring some other program you're instead writing your own program so that's the difference between openflow and p4 so before p4 came along the uh, switch programming was control plane based so switches expose certain functionalities and control planes would then uh, use those functionalities to manage the switches and then if you have read about sdn i'm guessing if you are doing a swap with hari babu sir you probably read about it you might have also noticed mentions of northbound and southbound apis so <clears throat> now i might my definition of the two might be switched so when i say northbound i might actually be talking about southbound so confirm that but northbound apis are apis that the control plane exposes to the outside world like this so now let's say this is my entire network right i'm cisco this is my entire network and google approaches me and they say that we want to be able to manage this network so what i'll do i'll expose some northbound api and then cisco servers can talk to that api so this is cisco so what will happen now is when cisco wants uh, sorry when google wants uh, this switch to behave a certain way 
Google has to talk to the control plane. The control plane will determine if what Google is trying to do is legal, and if it is legal, it's going to then talk to the switches to execute that. So it's that simple. That's all that there is to northbound APIs. And southbound APIs are the APIs that. Uh, are for the control plane to talk to the data plane. So we already spent a lot of time discussing those. So yeah, this is it. This is the programmable network architecture. Once again, we have a control plane, which is like the brain of the network. We have the data plane, which is like the muscles. The control plane handles all the all the logic, the management of network resources, automation and stuff, and the data plane handles the actual routing and forwarding of the data. Does anyone have any questions about this? <clears throat> I'll wait for twenty seconds. Wonderful. Okay, this was all conceptual. If you have questions about this and were hesitating to ask, you can stay back. Could you clarify OpenFlow again? Uh, okay. Uh, okay, you're a fresher, so you haven't programmed much probably. Um, think of it like this. You probably have like some kind of vehicle at home. Let's say you have a car. Right. Now, let's say we had a concept of cars being programmable. The kind of things that OpenFlow would allow you to do is like plugging in different appliances into the car. So like you put in and uh, you put in a music system inside your car. So now your car can play music. So you added a function to your car in a way. So you programmed it uh, in a way to play music. That's kind of analogous to what OpenFlow does with switches. Like the switches come with some preset functionality and OpenFlow lets the control plane modify that functionality. For people who have programmed, it's like writing a config for a software that somebody already wrote. It's like writing a template for WordPress. WordPress already exists. It already exposes some functionality. It already exposes an API. Your template can only use that API. Now, WordPress is flexible enough to support any template that you write. So in a way, it's programmable, which is why you see a lot of WordPress programmers out there doing freelance work. Right. So that's what OpenFlow is analogous to. P4, on the other hand, is like building your own WordPress, like writing it, writing your WordPress from scratch. So that is like true programmability. You're not configuring somebody else's software to behave in a way that you want it to. Instead, you are writing your own software. Does that clarify that? Cool. So this was um, concepts, theoretical concepts, mostly some use cases. Hopefully, this was enjoyable. Now, I'm going to give you like a quick demo of P4 uh, before we move on to the demo, there's one last slide. So P4 is like, uh, like I said, it, it, it's very simple, very crude programming language. It lets you directly program switch behavior. So, you know, back here, I said that you want to react within microseconds, right? You want to react to events as soon as they happen. Because in, in a matter of if you, if you, if the delay is like of a second, your switch could already go down. So even with the control plane, notifying the control plane of something is going to take time, then the control plane is usually very, it's slower than a switch because it's much more complex. It has a full-blown processor inside it, an x86 or something. And then the control plane is going to tell A and then all of this is going to happen, right? So this is slow, right? So what P4 does is, in addition to letting you program the control plane, it also lets you program the data plane. This is what data plane programmability means. You can write a P4 program to specify what a forwarding device is going to do from start to end. And again, this is going to be more clear when I give the demo. So 
instead of for some things instead of relying on the control plane you can now program your switch to handle them there and then so you can react to some events at the nanosecond level instead of microseconds so that's the that's one of the main advantages of p4 it lets you specify the exact behavior of your forwarding device and notice how i'm saying forwarding device here i'm not saying switch because switches are not the only forwarding devices so yeah so it's a it's a behavioral specification language it you can use p4 to specify what happens with a packet from the moment when it enters the switch to when it leaves again will be more clear in the demo now uh okay this is something that uh, if you guys read about this you're going to find this very um, interesting in how are forwarding devices and the control system connected they connected like any two network devices are connected through a like they're connected through the network how are two switches connected they connected through a wire so that's how uh like if you're wondering if control plane devices and data plane devices also use the network to communicate with each other then yes and that that's a fun statement like yes the network uses itself to manage itself yes okay i'll uh, move on so yeah something for you guys to read about which is very interesting so uh, if you remember back in the day graphic cards didn't exist like even when you wanted to play games the processing happened at your processor like whatever intel made whatever amd made whatever those processors were they were the ones who did all the computations for uh, all the graphical computations that was until somebody realized that these computations can be better performed if there was like a custom instruction set architecture for them now if you don't know what an instruction architecture instruction set architecture is if you're in first year uh you can either ignore what i'm going to say from here on or you can just uh, maybe read about it so that's how graphics cards uh, they came into existence somebody figured out that hey there's this graphic intensive computation there are some very common operations that happen in these computations and it's better if we implement these operations at like the processor level so that way we can speed this up by a lot so that's why graphics cards like a graphic card is a lot better than a cpu if you want to play games because it it's optimized the hardware is optimized for those kind of computations in a, in the same way like if you uh, if if you look at the latest headphones by sony or by google or by apple or if you look at the cameras in google pixel phones what you'll see is uh, there is some very specific functionality that uh, google or sony want to achieve and they do it directly at the hardware level like all all that digital signal processing like if you see uh, uh sony headphones have this uh, chip that they use for noise cancelling so they don't use software based noise cancelling they realize that the operations involved in noise cancelling are better handled by like a custom instruction set architecture so they implemented those at the hardware level apple does this a lot with their hardware they implement a lot of things right at the hardware level like if you look at the latest m1 processor what they did they, uh, a lot of ml operations they implemented right in the chipset a lot of uh, media based operations they implemented right in the chipset so the like the general theme of things is if you have if you want to do something and if you can implement it closer to the hardware if you can do it at the hardware level you can get a lot better performance now earlier what used to happen was we had software switches which is basically a linux machine acting like a switch it will receive a packet at one port and forward it to the other now the problem with this was that these software switches were running on x86 processors made by intel and amd and these processors they they are general purpose they're meant for programming in general they're not uh, like in the same way that they're not meant for graphical computations they're also not meant for packet switching and this is why like i think uh, there's a company called barefoot networks they are i think they are the ones who introduced p4 to the world 
and they came up with this pisa architecture portable independent switch architecture this is an instruction set of i think 11 or 12 instructions that are used for packet processing so the switches that they make they, you can think of them as like gpus for networks so uh, yeah uh, instead of running that switch software at like on x86 processors they are now running it on their own hardware so in doing that they limited the amount of programmability that they can have but they achieved a lot of speed and to quote the numbers the new tofino switches by barefoot networks they can handle throughputs of like 24 terabits per second that's terabits and the average throughput that a data center at google has is like 400 gigabits per second compare that to 24 terabits per second and google switches are not as programmable as barefoot network switches so google switches uh like they don't reveal what exact tech they use because of, like for obvious reasons but uh, google has backed open flow very uh, very strongly or at least they did now they are backing p4 very strongly so their switches were open flow switches and open flow switches because they were not fully programmable because they were restricted by hardware they were also faster because programmability always comes at the cost of performance and even those fast switches they went up to 400 gigabits per second and barefoot networks like it's like a miracle they made something that's more programmable and way way faster so there's a lot of scope here and there's a lot of reading to do if you want like even if you are into hardware or uh, if you if you're into uh, that uh, processors in general uh, it's it's very fun to read so yeah definitely check it out i'll in in the in the blog page where i shared the link uh, bitsacm.in/sdntalk i'll i'll link all these resources for you to read about later cool uh oh wait they must still left so i'm going to show you what a p4 program looks like so this is the code base for a network controller that i wrote it, it it's a control plane framework i'm calling it rise i did this as a, as my soft project under hari babu sir okay i'll change the theme can you see the can you read the code that i'm presenting Yes, you can. Cool. If you can't read the code, just write it in the chat box. I'll zoom it in even more. Okay, so I said that uh, PISA is protocol independent, right? Protocol independent switch architecture. What does protocol independence mean? <clears throat> it means that um, in your average switch, in your average network switch. what happens is like your router is an ipv4 router so it can handle ipv4 packets it can handle ethernet packets but if you send it packets of some other protocol it's just going to drop them it's not going to know what to do with them so it's going to implicitly assume that every packet that's coming to it is an ipv4 packet so that's what the that's what your router does now what p4 switches do is they don't assume they don't say that we're going to treat this like an ip packet instead they say they they tell the programmer that you have to specify to me how to treat this packet so this is what we're doing first we define ethernet headers right so we say that we want a mac address of 48 bits and a source address also of for, uh, of 48 bits destination and source addresses of 48 bits and then an ether type field uh, it you can read about the ethernet protocol ether type is basically to tell the switch what kind of uh internet protocol we're going to be using then we specify the ipv4 packet ipv4 is a famous protocol it it's structured like this the first four bits are version ihl diff serve total length identification flags ttl protocol etc etc then this is the source address <coughs> and this is the destination address i've specified this as a header 
in my program so what i'm telling p4 right now is that the packets that are going to come inside this switch you can expect these two kinds of headers on those packets so like i i defined here struct headers so these two kinds of headers can be expected right and now this is the parser the parser is what tells my program how to read the packet now you know what your router at home does somebody already programmed into it that the first 16 bits or the first uh, the first 32 bits inside this packet are going to be the destination ip address so it's always going to treat them like the destination ip address no matter what's in there so if the destination ip address is not in there if some other combination of bits is in there it's still going to treat it like that and forward it to that address whatever it is if you get what i mean so it's rigid in that right in p4 it doesn't work like that you have to you instead specify to your switch how exactly you're going to parse the packet like which uh, information is where so what we do here is this is the the parser is like a state machine so the start state is this so in the start state we simply say parse the ethernet packet now people who have uh, studied uh, theory of computation or logic they they would probably get this better so or digital design i guess so yeah anyway i'm not going to explain what a state machine is if you if you're interested you can read about it we don't have the time so it's a state machine the first state is to parse the ethernet packet and inside parse ethernet so i said transition this parse ethernet and then i defined the parse ethernet state here and inside this state the first thing i do is extract the header dot ethernet packet what this is saying is extract the first 48 plus 48 plus 16 how much is that it's 96 plus uh 10 plus it's 112 i think let's say is 112 just just for the sake of it so it's telling my program that the first 112 bits inside this uh inside this packet are the ethernet header and the first 48 bits of those are the destination address the next 48 is the source address and then the next 16 is the ether type if you are wondering where i am getting this 48 for uh, from it's th this so i have defined the type mac address t and i'm using it here so 48 is from here so this is what i did so i first extracted this and now i do another transition based on the ether type right so transition select from header dot ethernet dot ether type because now i have finally parsed the ethernet header i have access to it and this is the field i am uh, concerned with right now so based on this if the ether type is of type ipv4 type ipv4 i have designed defined here 0x800 and it's an hex so uh like in any packet in any ipv4 packet if the ether type is 0x800 it's an ipv4 packet that's the internet protocol that's what the internet protocol says so just a rule why, why is this why is it 0x800 not 0x801 ask the 100 guys that decided this it's a protocol just a rule so if it's that i know that now i have to parse ipv4 if it isn't that i know that this is just an ethernet packet no ipv4 assigned to it so i'll treat it like an ethernet packet so if it's ipv4 i now move to the state parse ipv4 and by moving to this state i then extract the ipv4 packet like so and once i'm done there is no more parsing for me to do and i accept now what does this mean this means that the this packet dot extract means that after uh those first 112 bits that i got after that the next four bits is the version of the ipv4 header then, then the next four is ihl then the next four is this and then the, you get the idea now we have packets now uh, verify checksum is just a uh, it's just it's just to check that the data inside the packet is legit we're not going to talk about this check some verification you can read about then we have the ingress pipeline now uh, this is 
This is where you'll see most of the stuff that I was talking about. So I have defined two actions here. I have defined a drop action, which will basically just mark the packet to be dropped, which means don't forward this anyway, discard this packet, forget about it. And then the IPv4 uh, forward action. And what this does is it takes these two inputs, right? And this is where I'm setting which port this packet will go out on. So the egress specification, ingress means when the packet comes inside the switch, egress is when it exits the switch. So yeah, it's just jargon. So the egress spec is set to port, which means that this port is where it's where the packet is going out of. And then I uh, do some additional uh, things. I decrease the TTL. The TTL is basically how often the packet can bounce. So if the TTL is five, the packet can go to one router, then the next, then the next, then the next, then the next. So after five routers, it's not going to be forwarded anymore. It's going to be dropped by the network. This is done so that packets don't keep uh, going around in networks forever. So because it's at a switch, I have to decrease its TTL by one. So I decrease that. I set the source address to the Ethernet destination, destination, uh, uh, the next destination to th this argument. And like the exact semantics of this, uh, you'll get once you uh, know how Ethernet actually works, how IPv4 works. Don't worry about that, just care about this statement. I'm specifying which port, which switch port this packet is gonna go out of. Then this is a table. This table is saying that the key that we want to match against is the destination address of the uh, of the IPv4 header. So header dot IPv4 dot destination address. And the kind of match that we want is the longest possible match. What the longest possible match means is I can have an IP like this. I can specify an IP like this and what the and then I can have one like this. Right, and then the action against this can be forward to port number one, and the action against this can be forward or can be dropped. Just drop this packet. Now what the LPM match means is whichever one of these IPs match more with the destination address, that one will be chosen. So if my IP address, the, the IP address on the packet was like this. In this case, this also matches. X dot X is 1.2 here, this part matches. So I could forward it, but this one matches more. So I'm going to drop this packet. If it was this, in this case, this doesn't match at all because it's one here, it's two here. So in this case, I'd forward it to one. Now, uh, you, didn't, uh, you don't need to know this for programmable networks. This is general network terminology. This is what an LPM match means. This is usually used to handle subnets inside networks. So this is the table. Then I've specified the actions, which all actions are available for the table. So I said that this table has IPv4 forward available, drop available, and the default no action available. And then I specify how many entries can be inside this table, so the size, and then the default action. So if I don't specify an action, do this. And notice how I didn't specify any table entries here. Can someone tell me why that is? Where am I gonna specify the table entries? Take a guess. No one? Uh, the table entries are actually going to be populated by the controller. They're not gonna be specified in the switch. So once the switch goes online, it's gonna be the controller that then uh, 
specify that populates this table. So right now I'm just defining this table. Actual data inside this table will then be populated by the controller. And this is a counter. So I'm basically just saying that I want a counter which can count four different things. So four, and I want to count packets and bytes with this counter that are arriving at a certain port. And I'm calling this counter port counter. And then this is the apply block. This is what specifies what's actually going to happen to my packet. These are just declarations. This is just a declaration of actions. This is just a declaration of a table. And this is just a declaration of counter. They're, by themselves, they're not going to do anything. I actually have to use them inside my apply block. So I apply them here. And what the first thing I do is register the packet that has arrived in the switch inside the counter. So I'm counting that packet. So port counter dot count. And I'm counting by ingress port. So if it comes at port number one, the first, the uh, if it comes at port number zero, the first entry of this counter is going to be incremented. If it comes at port number one, the second entry is going to be incremented. For, for port number two, the third, and for port number four, the, uh, the fourth entry is uh, going to be incremented for this counter. So uh, yeah, that's simple enough. And then I'm checking if the IPv4 header exists on this packet. In that case, apply this table. So this table is going to have entries. And this is just saying that take the packets data and match it against the table and call an appropriate action. So applying this table. Then there is egress. I'm not doing anything in egress. Then there is, again, checksum computation, which I'm not going to talk about. And then there's the D parser. The D parser is where you extracted some headers from the packet. You have to put them back on before you uh, transfer the packet forward. So that's what it's for. Now I'm going to show you how this is run. Can you see my terminal? Yes. And is the text visible there? Like, is it big enough? Oh, you can zoom in. Is it visible now? Yeah, better. Cool. So first of all, this is the directory that I have, right? This is the file that I just showed you, switch.p4, right? So first of all, I need to compile this. So P4 programs are not compiled universally. Like when, whenever you compile a C program, it compiles to a binary that runs. If you compile it on Linux, it will compile to a binary that will run on all Linux systems. P4 programs are not like that. So some P4 programs, right? There are different compilers for different switches. And for the software switch that we are using, that compiler will take this program and output a JSON file, which is like the compiled output. So let's compile it. So the compiler is uh, P4C. Then I'm going to specify the version of P4 that I'm using, which is P4.16. Then I'm going to, take, this is for uh, specifying how the switch will talk to the controller. I, we don't have enough time to get into details of this. You can, I'll share some links where you can read these. And we're going to specify an output folder and compile. Oh, wait, I think I did something wrong. Yeah, this should be. This should be P4 runtime files, I think. Yeah, it compiled. And if you see, there's now an out folder. And inside this out folder, I have three different files. This is the compiled output of the switch. And this is some extra information that the controller will use to communicate with the switch. Again, 
you can read about p4 runtime in your free time if you're interested so i just built my switch now i'm going to compile my controller and my controller is written in golang so i just need to call go build this is the binary that i'm going to execute now before that i need to bring up a network a virtual network again i'm doing this fast so i'm not going to explain what this virtual network is what mini net is how it how i wrote this or anything but just know that we have a network and it has two hosts again i'll start it again it has two hosts it has actually three hosts h1 h2 and h3 and it has these links there's one switch s1 and it has these links h1 to s1 h2 to s1 and s3 h3 to s1 so it's like one switch and all three hosts are connected to it now i'm going to run the controller i'm going to specify the binary so right now i ran the network but you'll notice i didn't specify the p4 program that uh, that needs to be run on the switch <coughs> and that's another great thing about p4 uh, based switches you can install these programs from the controller itself so right now i just started a blank switch so if i send a packet from h1 to h2 so if i do h1 ping h2 it's not going to do anything so three packets transmitted zero received 100% packet loss because the switch is blank no program is running there right now now i'm going to run my controller which i programmed to automatically install that program to the switch so i'm going to specify the program here so slash out slash switch dot json this was our output file and then some extra info for the controller to talk to the switch and i think that's it yeah the controller is on and this controller is programmed to count the packets that are incoming at every port like i showed you this counter where is it so this is the counter and we are outputting the values of this counter every 2 second to the terminal through the controller so check out these values and now if i do h1 ping h2 you'll notice that these values increment like this so this is again very rudimentary very simple example but you can see that the packets are getting transmitted now if i stop this 15 packets transmitted 15 received 0% packet loss and so on so my controller did install a program on the switch and it did the switch did count the packets that were arriving there now if you want to leave at this point you can leave i'm going to just very quickly explain controller code what i did there and even there i just want to explain what i populated inside the tables so yeah these are the entries i populated inside the tables i said that anything that comes for this ip address should be output to this port and the mac address specification should be this again for don't uh, worry about the mac address if you like you can read about ethernet if you want to know more about this and the second entry inside the table is that if the ip address is this 10.0.1.10 then the packet should be output to port number 2 now i can show you that if i change these entries the switch won't work anymore because then the table would be misconfigured because these are the ip addresses of the hosts so uh, you can clone this code from github it's open source and you can try this out on your own and then this uh, piece of code is to read the port counter so in the ingress pipeline read the counter that's called port counter like here this is the ingress pipeline and reading the counter counter which is called port counter simple enough and just output 
the data from that counter. So this is what the control plane is like. And uh, the code is actually not this small. There's a lot of packages behind the scenes that I wrote uh, for this controller. So this is like an application of the controller. So uh, yeah, this was it. If you have any questions, I am very free and jobless. So I can answer them right now if you want to ask. Other than that, uh, we are done with the session. I hope you had fun. Ports on the switch represent the network device connected to it, right? Ports on the switch are like literal ports. Uh, like uh, the, the stuff that you put wires inside. So yeah, yeah a, a single device is going to be connected to a single wire. So yes, it ports on switches do represent like single devices. You can say that. At this point, if you have questions, you can just ask for the mic and speak. Or you can write in the chat, so no problem. If you don't have questions, you can leave. Uh, we're done. Again, I hope you had fun. Nice, thanks. I think we can end the session now. Yeah, yeah, let's move to backstage. I guess oh. nobody has questions. <laughs>